for an entire generation. People have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible, on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. The force is strong here, even stronger than the coffee. Greetings, this is John Jackson Miller, author of Star Wars A New Dawn, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi. With Dan Z and Corey Club, this is the podcast you're looking for. We're happy to welcome returning guest and New York Times bestselling author John Jackson Miller to Coffee with Kenobi. John is the author of the upcoming A New Dawn, the exciting new novel that Star Wars fans are looking forward to. The book is the first story in the new canonical outreach headed by the Lucasfilm Story Group and introduces readers to Kanan and Hera. John was the very first guest we ever interviewed on Coffee with Kenobi, and it's great to have him back. Welcome back, John. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I, as we were getting ready to do this, I was just thinking about the last time we spoke with you, and you were our very first interview, and it was, you were just, you set the stage for us because you were so gracious and so intelligent, and you just, you helped us so much with the way you handle yourself and respond to our questions, and you gave us a lot of confidence to to get where we are now, and so we uh, attribute some of our credit to you, so we really appreciate that. Well, you see, you, you wrote a book called Coffee with Kenobi, so I felt obligated to come on here. If you had written Coffee with Crucible, then it would have been Troy Denning. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's right, or Arthur Miller, but he... You know, yeah, there, there you go. So, I mean, I, 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 I felt like it was something I, I needed to do. I was very enthused with the response, that the enthusiastic response that uh, that, that last book got, and I, I really appreciated uh, you know all the support that we got from the podcast. So, yeah, we're beginning it again here with a new dawn, which is wonderful and exciting. And and so we'll just start with our first question: How did you get the opportunity to write a new sure. dawn? Well, uh, this uh, storyline pretty much started uh, at the latter half of uh, 2013. Uh, you know, Kenobi was out; it was doing well, and I was looking for a project for uh, the winter and the. Uh, Rebels TV series was at that time uh, set for uh, you know a launch uh, in September. Uh, I think now it's going to end up being early October. I'm not sure what the actual date is, uh, but uh, the the notion was that they wanted to get something that would be a prequel to it, uh, and it would also fit uh, another niche that uh, Del Rey was looking for because. Uh, they knew that they had some darker books coming out, and of course now we know what those are. We have the uh, uh, the Lucino uh, Tarkin book and uh, the Paul Kemp uh, Lords of Sith book, and so it made sense that we would have uh, you know a more heroic book in the mix, uh, so they would be maybe a little lighter, but definitely where the you know the good guys are, are going to be a bigger part of it. Uh, and so I uh, began working, and uh, this, you know, it, it it made sense that as I was working, I would be coordinating with the folks on the Rebels TV series uh, because that was that was in process at the time. It's just that what we ended up doing wound up being uh, the first uh, in a new model of how they were going to be doing things, uh, which is you know now this Lucasfilm Story Group where. Uh, they they wanted to get uh, the folks with the movies and the TV series and uh, the novels and the comics uh, all coordinated uh, to a better degree than in the past. Uh, you know, the biggest problem that we always have with these things is the production schedules are so much different. Uh, you know, you cannot make a change to a TV series uh, based on you know something that just uh, we just decided to do five minutes ago in a book or a comic book. Uh, it doesn't doesn't really work like that. So things have got to be thought through a lot sooner, a lot earlier, uh, and that's what the story group uh, uh, you know uh, you know serves to to deal with. Uh, so you know, I did not realize at the time that uh, it was going to end up being you know this uh, you know starting point uh, that it wound up being. And in fact, I didn't you know, learn until fairly late in the writing of the book. Uh, that it would have an introductory role. Uh, hmm. But even then, it didn't require a lot of changes because I already write most of my you know, tie-in fiction such that it is introductory. Uh, you know, we, we, 
Uh, you, every book is somebody's first. Every novel, every comic book in a universe is somebody's first. Uh, whether we're talking about superheroes or Star Wars or Star Trek or or what have you. Uh, so you're already trying to write that way. And, you know, you used the word new outreach earlier. I mm-hmm. think that is absolutely the way to look at this thing. This this is not, not about changing the past or changing the way that 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 uh, that that people ought to feel about what's come out in previous times. This is about gearing up for a lot of new continuity coming in from the movies and a lot of new attention that's going to be coming in. Uh, the movies are seen by tens of millions of people. That's a lot of new readers. Uh, and we want to try to do something where uh, the existing readers are, are going to dig what we're doing. And also it's going to be something where it will be approachable for the new readers. You know, I realized the other day the, uh, the acronym for this book, uh, A New Dawn, is AND. And I think that is, oh, wow. is you know, we, we, we it couldn't have been planned better. We, we don't want uh, these fans or those fans. We want both groups. We want everybody. We want, a t- we want to see a time in which, you know, there's a new generation coming into the readership uh, that is enjoying the stuff just as much as the folks that have been in since 1977 like me. That's awesome. That's I love it. It's inspirational. Did you, uh, the one thing, maybe you're not allowed to answer this, but did, did they specific, how early uh, in, after Kenobi was released, or was it during the writing of Kenobi that you knew you were going to get a chance to tackle this world of Rebels? Well, it was, uh, it was uh, the latter part of uh, 2013. So it was, uh, it was just a matter of getting the timing to work out so that I could uh, you know, talk with uh, Dave Filoni and and uh, you know talk with uh, the other folks, uh, the executive producers uh, via uh, you know notes coming back and forth uh, on the the plots that I was submitting. Uh, you know, I it, it it took a while to get uh, everything synced up so that the universe was being shown as it should be. Uh, several years before Rebels, which is when this is set. We all had our ideas of what the dark times should be like. We just needed to make sure that it, it tracked back properly from, from the way things are seen in Rebels. And, of course, also we, need to, uh, we needed to make sure that uh, where Kanan and Hera, the two characters who come in from Rebels uh, into this book, uh, you know, where they are in their lives uh, is, is critical uh, to my being able to write. I had to know what they were going through, what the life should be like for them. And then I needed to have feedback from them about my decisions for what they would actually be doing. Uh, you know, it occurred to me that Kanan had to have a job. Uh, he had to have some sort of way to bring in money because the Empire really wasn't going to allow him to hang around uh, uh, you know, important places uh, unless he had something to do. It's just that you know he isn't he doesn't take jobs because uh, he wants to be part of the system or anything like that. He's just trying to make it to happy hour. Yes, uh, and <laughs> yeah. that, that and that and that that really does sync up with with what uh, you know what I understand to be who Kanan will be uh, later on. I mean, it, it it's this is this this really is what he should be doing at this stage of the game. Exactly, and we're excited to learn about these brand new characters. And I know, you know, when they announced kind of some of these, these new books coming out and things like that, um, I think you had a trip to Lucasfilm and there was a, there was a video that you were, you were in, I think, um, that the stores, uh, store group came out with. Uh, how was that? Uh, tell us a little about that. That was, uh, fascinating. Again, this is, uh, this, uh, you know, fairly late in the writing. Uh, and I, I, you know, as I was informed that, you know, a lot of these changes would be taking place, I, uh, I was, uh, asked by uh, Del Rey to go out to California and you know shoot this video, and I uh, you know I had already had plans because I was heading to a, a convention uh, in Memphis later uh, the week that they wanted to do the shoot, and they said you know this is so important we're gonna we're gonna uh, you know send you to California then you can we'll go directly from there to to Memphis and we'll send your books to you and everything and it all worked out wonderfully uh, and I, I really appreciate that they were able to do that. Uh, and of course, you know, I get out there and, uh, and there's Timothy Zahn, uh, waiting in the car. And so, <laughs> oh, so you uh, didn't even I, know. Well, I mean, we, we sort of knew, uh, it's just, uh, we, we were both invited out there 
And I managed to get him completely lost while we were trying to look for Lucasfilm. Uh, a lot of those buildings look alike out there. There is a little Yoda statue, and I managed to walk straight past it. Uh, but, but anyway, yeah, I'm, I, I'm a writer, not a map maker. Uh, to <laughs> that almost sounds like a Star, a Star Trek, Trek phrase. Yeah. Uh, it, well, and we can get into that later because I've gone to the dark side on that as well. But that's, <laughs> true. That's uh, but but yeah, I I I I think that uh, it was uh, it was a real fun experience. What they wanted to do with that video was to sort of uh, you know have a couple of people who had uh, you know followed along with Star Wars uh, throughout the uh, you know, all the years of uh, tie-in fiction, both of comics and the novels and everything else. Uh, they wanted to get our point of view and uh, and you know have you know, in particular I was able to speak to it as as a fan who had grown up with it all and uh, and that was uh, that was great and again that that came out uh, they posted that uh, on YouTube I think at the end of April and and that is actually ingenious on their part because you're the perfect person to to kick this off for a couple of reasons that come to mind one you understand the the world of comics better than most people do. And you understand the different timelines, the different canons, so to speak, that happen. And you also inspire a lot of Star Wars fans with confidence because when they see John Jackson Miller is kicking off this new canonical vision and focus, that fills people up with a lot of excitement. I know that Corey and I was the first thing we said, hey, we know that guy. All right. And he's, yeah. he's kicking it off. That was wonderful. <laughs> so you've got this new process when you're running brand new canon. And how much did you have to work with Dave Filoni, Simon Kinberg, Ray Wiseman, and everybody at the Lucasfilm Story Group? Did you get to speak with them personally through Skype? Or- I, I, uh, I, I had notes coming back from the other two executive producers because you know, those guys are pretty busy working on the series. Uh, Dave uh, sat in on a uh, conference call that we all did where you know, he, he described what Kanan you know, should be like and what his attitude should be and, and really how he would – feel about the situation that that I put him in you know the plot really is is mine in the sense that it's you know it's a it's a it's a caper a storyline an event uh that mm-hmm. that that I had come up with before I even had the conversations with them about it uh but then we tried to work together and get it all to sync up so that the characters would connect properly uh and you know I I uh you know I feel that the book does what I wanted it to do in terms of depicting uh, what the empire is like in this time frame, where it's it's in the early enough days that it's growing dramatically, and it, in the process, it's rolling over all these planets and these people's lives, uh, and people are beginning to realize, oh gosh, this empire is not a great, it's not as good an idea as we thought it was. Uh, so you have you have that going on, and then also I really like the fact that it uh, it sort of hits some of the same notes. As Kenobi, as Knight Errant, as mm-hmm. Knights of the Old Republic, even uh, a bit of Lost Tribe of the Sith, uh, this notion of what Jedi should do when they are alone, when they don't have the uh, the order, when they don't have uh, the rules of uh, of the order to uh, you know deal with, don't have the guidance. You know, Kanan is uh, in a sense uh, living like Luke Skywalker. You know, a Jedi without uh, without you know a, a big structure out there to tell him what he should be doing uh, and so yeah I, I was really happy to have that uh, come across in the book and again this is why I, I really you know for for as much as uh, some people are uh, exercised about this and I understand why because uh, uh, I'm a fan like everybody else uh, you know my feeling is it's all still Star Wars. It's all still of a piece. People who read A New Dawn who didn't know any of the business of how it came to be or the story group or anything else would probably not be able to tell it out of a lineup with other Star Wars books that we've already done. Uh, it, it really, you know, there's nothing in this book that uh, you know is is really directly contradictory. Uh, of of much of anything that I'm aware of, I certainly didn't set out to do that. No, I, uh, I, made very, I agree with you. I, I made very few changes at all once I learned that it would have this uh, this opening position. All I did was just try to punch up a little more, uh, you know, explaining Star Wars, explaining what Jedi were, explaining what the who the Sith were. Uh, that's that's about it. I mean, I, I my approach, as I say, I I always. Every time I am given the keys to this land speeder, I try to get it <laughs> back with no dents, and I try not to <laughs> run over nice. anything. So, <laughs> so far, so, so good. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, 
look, all of this is about really is just making sure that the folks that are making the movies have as much latitude, as much running room as they need to 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 do the best movies they possibly can. And you know what they've said about the legends and everything. Uh, you know, I think Pablo had the line that the thing about legends is that legends can be partially true, mm-hmm. uh, or parts or, or or bits. And and there are you know there are things from previous books and guides and and things that are in Rebels that are in A New Dawn. Uh, you know it it just means and they become canon. Although I will uh, say know, I, this I, was I your just, chance to get well, rid of Calf, and you you kept it in the canon. <laughs> well, the, the, well, the thing is, and and a, and a few things have been tweaked. Uh, but, and, and, and we'll get into that, you know, after the book comes out so, <laughs> a, a bit, but I, I, I think that, that, that it's, it, I really, and I've said this elsewhere, I don't think people ought to get into the parlor game of, oh, because this thing has been mentioned, then this entire story that it was associated gets dragged in with it. Right. Uh, th- I, I, I think it, that, that really, you know, th- is, is. It, I, I I don't think that's probably the right way to look at it. It becomes uh, pedantic I, I and that, kind of muddies the water, really. Well, I mean, some of the places where I use things uh, are, are places where it simply didn't make any sense to use something different or make, some, make something new up. Yeah, you don't uh, need to reinvent the wheel when you've already got an established, beloved saga yeah, there. I mean, I, it, I mean, to an extent, it's like uh, you're writing a, a, a role-playing game module uh, you know, for a universe that's already developed. Uh, you're writing new stories set in this universe. That doesn't mean that you create uh, necessarily have to create all new planets, all new species, all new everything. When some of them are already up there on the screen, uh, and uh, and and again, some of it has already been uh, you know laid out back there as as possible material to mine. Uh, so so again, yeah, I I uh, I really did try to write this uh, for everybody, and uh, I, I hope that uh, that. You know, people will embrace it in in that way. I am really happy that Del Rey put out uh, you know those you know, many many advanced editions that we uh, released at San Diego with the complete text because mm-hmm. I think that really ought to show people the approach. It does, and it and it's. Um, I don't think anyone's going to be disappointed because you you've managed to take um, pretty much unexplored turf, and you've made you you made it feel like Star Wars, and the, like people keep saying about what they're seeing of the trailers for Rebels. You're making it feel like it's a part of A New Hope, but it's also a little bit before that because there's that, there's that edge to it. And how exciting that how you are, you're basically taking the Empire uh, and taking some pre-established things of the Empire, but you're shaping it in such a way that 100 years from now, how people view the Empire will be because of how you started to pilot the ship, which is exciting. <laughs> no pressure, right? But it's already written, so it's too late now. Well, 100 years is a little bit farther off than oh. I can. Uh, I'm, yes, we're optimistic. I mean, no, I, I got you. Uh, it's what we brew in the coffee, well, I, John. I will say, oh, I got you. No, I, I, I'll say, I really do. Uh, I, I, I really do appreciate getting to write uh, about this particular period because it wasn't, it wasn't a time that was open for a long time. Uh, that was much, you know, that was available to be elaborated on. Uh, and you know, as somebody who, you know, my, uh, you know, my. My graduate school studies were, uh, you know, uh, in the Soviet Union and how it uh, I was reading about how it uh, went from being an agrarian country to uh, you know this industrial military powerhouse over the course of 20 years, uh, although at, at the cost of over 20 million lives. Uh, you know, that rang a lot of the same bells. We were, you know, we were in class talking about the empire in Star Wars, uh-huh. uh, you know, back then as – yeah, this is a similar thing because clearly, if the empire you know started as we thought it did at that point, uh, you know, at 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 a point earlier in Obi Wan Kenobi's life, uh, you know, then that that empire had only you know twenty thirty years, some somewhere like that. This is what we thought at the time because we didn't know how old Obi Wan would be shown to be in the in the in the previous you know, in the prequels. Uh, now we we looked at all of that and said. Yeah, wow. I mean, uh, this is this is this is a similar phenomenon. Uh, you know, the Republic, this trading organization, is hijacked and transformed into uh, you know this military uh, you know mammoth in nineteen years' time. Uh, you know, how does that happen? How do they get into the Star Destroyer business? <laughs> how does how 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 do they get into the Death Star business? Uh, the, this is the sort of thing that uh, you know. There's a lot of 
uh, wheels that had to be turning in the background that we just didn't know about. Uh, one of the things that I love about what we did with A New Dawn is we didn't focus on the bright center of the galaxy. We did not set focus on you know, the big places, the big threats. Uh, we went out to one of the many, many uh, industrial supply worlds that the uh, Empire needs in order to get all these Star Destroyers built. Uh, and, you know, uh, of course, you know, the Star Destroyer is built out of a lot of parts, uh, a lot of different strategic materials coming from a lot of different places. Well, that's a lot of planets that the Empire has to uh, basically put its foot down on and, uh, you know, squeeze as much material out of as possible. Uh, and that gives us our villain in the book and our oppression. And uh, that sort of leads into how you know, Hera meets Kanan and how they end up doing what they have to do in the book. We certainly uh, have a good fixture on that, and I love that you had the setting there. Just, it was something we have never seen before, and especially you know getting in the, into these these characters and, and kind of seeing their, their their backstory a little bit. We've already been introduced with them uh, with a seven minute trailer. Some some clips online have been uh, put out there for us to see them in action on the TV show. Uh, but just referring to the the book here uh, in Kanan especially, uh, he's not entirely likely likable. All that much, uh, which is kind of a risk, I think, a little bit. Uh, so, talk about a little bit about that and those choices uh, while the writing process. Well, Kanan would say that women love him. Uh, <laughs> yes, he would. Yeah. <laughs> he just well, let's track back and think about who this guy is. I mean, if he's somebody who uh, has been spent his early years, his teenage years, on the run from the Empire, at least figuring that he's on the run. Uh, um, assuming that somebody's after him, uh, he's probably somebody who's fairly prickly. He's probably somebody who who wants his space. He doesn't want people to to be around him too much. He probably doesn't form long friendships. Uh, and you know, he he is not a guy who uh, is necessarily uh, going to be a hail fellow well met. Uh, he, he's going to be somebody who is, uh, you know, he, he's not going to be a radioactive personality that you, you've <laughs> got to keep away from because if he, because if he overdoes it too much, he attracts attention. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, he really does wind up being as, as, you know, uh, Filoni and the rebels crew have kind of, you know, said from time to time, you know, there's a, there's a cowboy element to him. Uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's somebody who, uh, has an attitude, likes his space, uh, and, uh, he, he's, he's not, he's not, uh, he's not necessarily going to be your best buddy. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it was, uh, it was fun to get to write that, uh, and have him sort of, you know, play off of the other characters that, uh, that are in this book. Hera, certainly, of course, their interplay is fun. Uh, but then I developed these other, these other figures in the book who were reflective of the fact that I wanted to tell about, uh, how in most revolutions, you know, the early revolutions, you, you don't necessarily get your highest quality people that are, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that are uh, uh, you know, that are working for the cause. Uh, you know, a lot of revolutions tend to start out with the crazy people uh, or, or, or the people who uh, are not really political in uh, their thinking, but just have been forced into a decision, forced into a move, forced into a move. Uh, nobody in this book really sets out. Uh, with the notion of striking against the empire, uh, this is not a rebel cell that we're showing. Uh, this is this is uh, in 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 Hera's case, yes, she's doing reconnaissance. She's trying to find out what the what the uh, the empire's uh, abilities are, and and you know trying to get some uh, you know dirt on the empire to to use against it in recruiting later on. But she certainly doesn't feel like that you know she's anywhere close to being able to strike against it. And she sure doesn't believe that the people in this book, uh, you know, Zaluna, uh, Skelly, and uh, and Kanan are anybody that uh, is really rebel quality. So it, it is, it is, uh, it's reflective of a particular time within the rebellion, uh, the kinds of characters that are in the book and what they end up doing. Well said, well said. And, and uh, so you, when you're doing this, you, you've got the Rebels TV series coming out. Obviously, it's, it's debuting on Disney. It's aimed at children so how did you balance this when you're writing an adult centered novel especially considering the more violent aspects of a new dawn that that happened around the count of especially 
Well, it's on Disney XD, and it's probably aimed a little, a uh, little older than maybe Clone Wars was. I mean, it, it, it's yeah, certainly we're 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 seeing stormtroopers getting shot here as opposed to droids, uh, and 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 naturally, it's going to be a darker series because it's a little bit of a darker time that we're dealing with. Um, but you know that that that's that you know, you know having to do with rebels. You know, I haven't really seen enough of it to tell you. You know, you know the the specific angle they're going to take story direction wise. Most of what I know about it is from you know the very early uh, you know story bible time when I was working with it. I, but I certainly tried to reflect in my book uh, the darkness uh, to a degree. I mean, uh, well, obviously, uh, we're, we're this this book is set on a planet where the sun never rises, mm-hmm. uh, which is good point. Which is a little, which is a little a little fun considering that our title is a new dawn. Uh, <laughs> You know the the uh, so so we have that uh, you know the fact that it kind of splits the difference between the young adult and the adult age groups. Uh, yeah, well, I think Star Wars kind of does that anyway. I mean, Star Wars when it was initially reviewed was looked at as a children's movie uh, by, by some reviewers. Uh, it 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 you know certainly gets into it gets into darker uh, feelings, but you know we we there's always there's always you know comic relief there in the droids and 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 everything else. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that you know we really did kind of try to split the difference to a degree. Uh, you, you know, even when you get to uh, to Doug Wheatley's cover, uh, which was one where you know, the story group worked a lot on that cover with him to you know get a look for the characters that was halfway between uh, you know what we see in the animated series and how you would depict them if they were uh, flesh and blood. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there, there is once again. There's that and word. We're trying to get everything. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to cross the boundaries as much as we can. Exactly, and I love that you're approaching this too. I mean, it gets me excited about all the folks who are going to be running out to grab this book up. Um, now, referring back to the Canaan, and, and you spoke a little bit about Hera and their motives and things. How did you get in their heads? Uh, knowing the animated series is is coming on the heels of your novel. Uh, and your work will obviously impact the, the future of the animated series. How, how did you jump inside their their thoughts and, and actions? Well, in the case of Kanan, and I, I spent the most time with with Kanan writing the book. Uh, it was simply a matter of you know thinking through who he was, uh, you know, when he leaves the company of the Jedi, uh, and trying to figure out what he would have done in the steps in between. Uh, and again, you know, where, where he is at this point in time, he really is taking jobs that, uh, are short term. They are fairly dangerous. Uh, in the case of, uh, in the case of, uh, what he's doing in the book, he's actually, you know, hauling explosives. It's similar to, uh, you know, one of those guys, like you would see the, you know, the ice road truckers on, uh, on cable TV. (laughs) Yeah. So, so, I mean, he's doing a daring thing. He's being attracted to jobs where, by nature, nobody stays in it very long, uh, but you get a lot of money. Uh, and and uh, the reason most people don't stay in it very long is they they get blown up or they they you know get disgusted and quit. Um, you know he this gives him a chance to go from job to job to job, planet to planet to planet, uh, and not raise a lot of eyebrows, not uh, not set off a lot of alarms. Uh, this is who he is. Uh, as I saw it coming into the book, uh, it just so happens, though, the moment that Harris shows up uh, on this planet uh, happens to be uh, right near the end of one of Kanan's longer stays on a planet where he's actually started to make he's got a, he's got one really good friend uh it was probably the best friend that he's he's may may have had in all these years uh and so he's already thinking you know it's time for me to jam it's time for me to get out of here uh when this woman shows up and you know between the two of them yeah he sees that oh gosh well yeah maybe i, I should open my eyes to what's going on around me uh you know hera i tried to keep hera a bit of a locked door to a degree because uh yeah she is a woman who uh, you know, certainly has her reasons for doing what she's doing, uh, but I didn't think that it was my role in the book to go there. Uh, you know, this is this really was more a book about Canaan and his history and his past. I really think you did a, a marvelous job of, of making Hera this 
uh, enchanting enigma. So I, I think you completely nailed that. It, 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 in fact, you made Hera more appealing for me. And I was already, already thinking she was going to be my favorite character because of how Vanessa Marshall has been and how awesome and strong Hera looks. But you completely nailed that. So props to you. And, and that's the big challenge, I think, when you're creating these characters that you know are going to be canonical. It, it's got to be especially challenging to create a new villain in Star Wars, especially in this time period that the book takes place. So how did Count Vidian come to life, and what challenges did he bring to you as a writer and creator? Well, Vidian was fun. Uh, Vidian was a character that I, I wanted to uh, have represent a, a particular type of person that the Emperor would have co-opted and brought into the New Order. Uh, you know, in these early days, the Emperor would have been trying to to uh, co-opt a lot of the industrialists and the aristocrats and the, the big manufacturers, the big names with uh, the Republic. Uh, he already would have had connections with some of them uh, through his secret ties with the separatists. He, he already would have had ties to them uh, just through his role as chancellor. Uh, but you know, pretty clearly, you know, how he's able to get everybody else on board is through, you know, the, the passing out of favors, the, uh, you know, the offering of, of, you know, short-term power and titles and that sort of thing uh, to get everybody to come along on board on this big adventure. Uh, what is the big adventure? And I thought about this some, and A New Dawn actually gets into to a degree uh, and and again, I'm, I'm I'm not trying to you know uh, rewrite history or anything here. Uh, but what is the empire trying to do at this point? Uh, I thought about it and realized that you know the, re- the the republic during all of its years, the republic probably would have been both attracting planets to join and repelling them at the same time. Uh, this is not like Star Trek with the Federation where, you know, it's, we want as many people to join as possible because we all want infinite diversity and, and, and as many, as, as many people out there as possible. It struck me that in, in the Republic, the way that things would work is, yeah, they would want to bring in these new markets for goods, but every time you brought in a new planet, you would end up diluting the power of the core worlds. You would end up diluting the power of the individual senators. So a lot of planets would wind up on the Republic's doorstep waiting to get in. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, it's, it, uh, there's a little bit about how that works just in our own country's history. You know, we don't have 573 states uh, because <laughs> you know, anytime, you try to, anytime, you, anytime you try to bring somebody else in, it dilutes the power of the, of the states that already exist politically. Uh, and so it occurred to me that the, the, the emperor's you know, attitude would be the absolute opposite. He would want to grow as fast as possible. Uh, he would want to take control of as much as possible. And uh, we do see this. It must have happened between episode three and episode four that we get this enormous Star Destroyer fleet. We get this enormous uh, industrial and military machine. We get this enormous number of recruits to wear the, star, uh, the, to, to wear the Stormtrooper uniforms. Where does that all come from? How does that come about? Uh, it certainly comes about at the loss of many lives uh, mm. and and uh, through the destruction of many uh, planets' biospheres. Uh, and and that, that's what I wanted to show here in the book. Uh, but Vidian represents a particular kind of cat in this. He is he is a guy who is uh, in 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 the latter days of the Republic. He was one of these turnaround experts. He was one of these guys that you would see on CNBC every fifteen minutes. Oh yes, uh, you know, one of these motivational speaker guys whose job has been to go from industry to industry, fixing it or or you know repairing it or whatever. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, if not repairing it, then getting the money out of it. Uh, you know, Gordon Gecko, Larry the Liquidator. We've got these characters <laughs> like that. In, yeah, we've got we've got these characters like that in uh, in uh, in a lot of uh, in a lot of fiction. And of course, readers of my overdraft work know that I love Wall Street. I think it's just a, a fun thing to have interact with outer space. Oh, I didn't um, even think about that connection. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so so we have here a guy that he signs on with the emperor as a, an imperial efficiency expert. He really is uh, you know, tasked with going from these industrial strategic worlds from one to the next to the next, uh, sorting them out. Uh, you know, crushing the uh, local opposition, 
um, you know, taking the local institutions that had existed out there uh, that we already knew about in Star Wars, all the mining guilds and all the all the shipping, uh, you know, combines, all the things that we've known about for years had to somehow be, you know, co-opted, coerced, turned into something that only served the Empire. Uh, and yet at the same time, he's got to do it in a way that it, it makes people still think they're invested or that they have control over their own lives. Um, the Empire does not actually go around taking over and nationalizing industries. We know that. A lot of the manufacturers still stay in business, but they must have done that through uh, you know, a number of deals with the Emperor or the Emperor has co-opted them somehow uh, to get them to, to go along. Vidian it comes from that world, and so – we see in him uh, you know, a reflection of what's happening uh, you know, it, to the empire and to the people living in it on that commercial manufacturing side. And then you know, just to mention one of the other you know, uh, uh, antagonists in the book, uh, I love Captain Sloan. I, I really mm-hmm. enjoyed writing her. She, is, yeah. she, is, uh, she represents the new empire uh, or the new imperial, uh, you know, somebody who grew up. Uh, you know, in the very latter days of the Republic and, uh, you know, is anxious to get out there and be part of this grand new mission to, you know, you know take control of as much of the galaxy as possible. She's a believer. And I think that's I think that's something that uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of uh, with the Empire, uh, just because uh, it, 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 we haven't seen a lot of stuff in this period. And uh, whether she stays a believer forever, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll obviously have to see what happens to her in this in this book, and and uh, and who knows about later on. Uh, but there had to be, it seemed to me, people in the very beginning uh, who were uh, you know co opted thoroughly and uh, who who believed in the system. I, I'm intrigued by her uh, relationship with with Count Vidian, and who is certainly a very despicable character and uh, one of those villains that I think people are really going to be. Fascinating by, and I love that paragraph where you talk about and you first introduce this idea of the new empire and how they're waiting for the old guard, so to speak, to essentially get out of the way uh, organically, if if at all possible. I, I found that really great. You, you've opened up some new exciting doors with that. Well, I it, again, this goes back to you know so many revolutions in history. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's these are the people who uh, you know. Uh, who who are attached to the old ways and what is count vidian's catchphrase forget the old way forget the old ways yes. uh, yeah. this is this is uh you know, I, I i really was striving to uh encapsulate some of the big questions that the galaxy would be dealing with in the specific characters and what they were doing absolutely and that's a great uh, segue into our next uh, question here uh, you mentioned a little bit a previous answer about uh, your background in world history how did that lend itself uh, to building the, this world and Star Wars Rebels? Well, it, pretty much as as I described, you know, we've got uh, we've got a, a an existing organization, an existing state, the Republic, that has to be transformed quickly into this new this new thing, this monstrosity. Uh, and you know, we see a little bit of it when I was uh, when I was writing Kenobi. Um, there is a scene where uh, you know Obi Wan Kenobi sees uh, in Mos Eisley. Uh, he sees one stormtrooper. <laughs> mm-hmm. He sees one stormtrooper and one imperial official, basically walking around taking inventory, seeing well, what is it that we've got? Uh, that's what the very earliest days, uh, you know, in, in in a place like that would have been like. Uh, you know, we still have the old sign on the door outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Outside the Republic offices everywhere. Uh, at, but now we're several years in. So we're into, uh, you know, the, the, the old organization uh, is, is now, you know, completely you know, transformed into the new one. Um, but you can still see all the people that were involved with the old parts of the organization. Uh, many of them are still involved and many of them still have expectations based on what went before. A great example here is the surveillance subplot that we've got in this book. Mm. It struck me that that was something that we absolutely had to deal with. Orwellian, something, really, I thought. Yeah, and 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 you know, and I thank you for going to Orwell instead of to Edward 
Absolutely. Snowden. Uh, because I know, I know, I know uh, cause I, uh, a lot of people's memories only go back about a year. <laughs> oh, well, I'm an English teacher. I have to go do that. Uh, well, very good. Yeah. Orwell is the way, Orwell is the way to go. Uh, yeah. I, I, that, that was, it was not my intent to, you know, uh, you know, tell something which was, uh, you know, tied into something ripped from today's headlines. Uh, you know, because certainly I consider, uh, you know, state surveillance, uh, you know, in state, out of state, uh, of whoever, it's just a tool of, of 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 governments. Wherever you go, whenever you go, they've always had it someplace, somewhere, somehow. Uh, it, it, it's just you know the technology that's that's changed in our own world that's different. Uh, but it struck me that they had to have had something like this already in the Republic. Um, there had to be commercial surveillance, certainly. Uh, just uh, for all the marketing going on. Remember, the Republic is all about making money uh, for its member states. So, so there had to be institutions out there already for that. Uh, and then also there would have been uh, you know, a, 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 a slight paranoid culture that would have been developing during the whole Clone Wars. Uh, you know, because certainly you know, places like Gorse, the planet that we see in, uh, in this uh, book would have been a planet that uh, if you were the separatist, you might be thinking about going after. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, 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 there are characters associated with, uh, with the surveillance state uh, that, uh, that we get to show in here. And again, as with Sloan and the empire, you know, we get to see that the characters that, uh, that do this job, uh, you know, they, they don't just wake up overnight and realize, Oh my gosh, we're we're doing a terrible thing. Uh, you know, these are people who have long been committed to the notion that the world is better off because we keep an eye on people, and uh, and you know that's that's a that's a thing which can be corrupted later on by the emperor who you know then uses it not just to keep an eye on people but to control what they think. Very much so. It, it ties in quite powerfully to uh, the emperor getting his tentacles out everywhere. So now we've got this notion. Now you've got a book that you're writing, you've written a lot of Star Wars before. A lot of people have absolutely loved and embraced them, uh, Corey and I included. Uh, so you've got this book now that's canon, and your writing could impact Rebels, Episode 7, and beyond. How does that change your writing process and your approach versus when you wrote for the EU or the Legends line? It, it, uh, it doesn't because I have always treated uh, Star Wars, and I've used, this, I've used this expression before, as a national park where I try mm-hmm. to leave it in the condition that I found it, uh, you know, pack in or pack out what you came in with. Uh, you don't leave your garbage thrown around. Um, you know, the, the, you know, when I first started in star Wars, uh, my editor, uh, explained that one of the things that, that he, uh, you know, thought was a, a bugaboo or a flaw of new writers coming in was that they wanted to get their ha- you know, fingerprints on star Wars everywhere. Uh, they wanted to you know, add things, name things, leave things, mm-hmm. and certainly in my day, I have, I've, uh, you know, I've uh, done a few things where, you know, hey, I got to name the, uh, I got to name the, uh, the space slug. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and that was kind of fun. Uh, you know, there, there are various things I got to do, but that was never the point, point. Uh, and I never did them to try to leave a mark on Star Wars forever. And and again, it is it has gotten uh, as people as time has gone on, and people have gotten more information. And and we've been able to talk a bit more. Uh, everybody's gotten a lot more comfortable with what's happening. Uh, you know, it, there wasn't even a single question about it at, at uh, the San Diego panel, uh, I, I, and I'm glad for that. But I mm-hmm. mean, in the very earliest days, people were saying, "Well, how do you feel about all these old things that you've done not being part of it anymore?" And my my feeling was, you know what? I never wrote these things to be a part of it. I wrote these things so that they would be good stories. Mm-hmm. And if you if you dug the stories. I don't care about the rest of it because honestly, look, I got 10,000 DC comics out there in my collection. None of them are in current canon. Half of, my, <laughs> half of my half of my favorite Batman stories weren't in continuity to begin with. You know, and and maybe that was a just a feature of San Diego Comic-Con where, you know, most of the people there have gone through this many times. You know, changes to how things are uh set up in timelines like that 
you know, it happened all the time in comics. They've got to happen all the time in comics because, you know, the Fantastic Four started really trying to get to the moon. <laughs> you know? That's right. <laughs> uh, or the star. Actually, it might have been the stars. But whatever it was, it was, you know, uh, you know Sergeant Fury was in World War II. Uh, we have had to retcon all these. Nick Fury was in World War II. We have, yeah. We've had all these things that we've had to either retcon or fiddle with or just bring things forward. One of my earliest jobs in comics was uh, writing Crimson Dynamo, which is another another oh, Russian yeah. related uh, thing, uh, where I updated the uh, I updated the uh, you know this Russian superhero or this was a super villain to begin with, updated his, his origin story from the 1960s so that it actually you know synced up better with uh, the way things are today. Um, that eventually will have to be moved yet again uh, to re- reflect the fact that uh, you know it's it's 2030 or 2040 or whenever. Uh, it, it, this just does not, you know, really feel to me like a part of why I write these books. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I write them uh, with the other books in mind. I try not to uh, overrule or erase anything. Same, uh, same for uh, for any other franchise I'm working on. Uh, but really, why I'm there is to write a good book. The only difference between Kenobi, the hardcover, and Kenobi, the soft cover, is the word legends. And the fact that the soft cover costs, I think, uh, twenty dollars less, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or twenty nineteen, something like that. Uh, and also, the soft cover has—I uh, just now realized—the uh, soft cover has got in it the uh, the uh, short story that I wrote for Star Wars Insider, uh, and right. a pre- oh, awesome. and a preview of the uh, a preview of the uh, of the New Dawn. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's that that's the way I look at it. These these stories will be with us; they're going to always be around. And I, I'm confident that enough years will pass. Uh, it, it will be difficult to tell what changed and when. I agree. And, and I think now that we have such a concerted effort with the story group, uh, people who are in charge uh, and are monitoring this stuff meticulously will make sure that things line up as best as they possibly can. And that gives creative people like yourself a chance to tell a great story that needs to be told. And that is something that, I think people are going to love about A New Dawn. We have these Star Wars stories that need to be told and expand upon the universe. Perhaps the best thing I've heard uh, with this canonical debate versus Legends, um, and one of our listeners brought this up, and the name escapes me, so I apologize, but you know who you are. Uh, They compared it to King Arthur and how there's so many different stories and versions of King Arthur. My goodness, Steinbeck has a a lot of great stuff on King Arthur, but they're all still great stories that impact you, and who knows – what will sprinkle and land in the canonical universe anyway? It it all builds to well, add, paint this canvas at Star Wars. Well, I'll tell you who said that. Uh, Shelley Shapiro said that at the panel in, in San Diego. Oh, she, no kidding. He brought up King Arthur and, and yeah, and so uh, yeah, I'm not saying that whoever you talked to didn't get come up with it independently, but sure. Uh, but she, but it might have been it might have come from Shelley to begin with. Wow, yeah, absolutely. I mean, good lord, try to find Robin Hood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just try, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's, there, there are, there are books and books and books devoted to the things that these people either did or didn't do. And even Tarzan, you know, uh, well, uh, well, but uh, well, uh, here, here's, here's a, here's a good example from our own history. And, and, uh, you know, I just watched the movie the other day, the untouchables. Oh uh, yeah. 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 The untouchables is about Elliot Ness, who was a real person. But a lot of the stuff that's in that movie, yes, obviously, simply never happened. Uh, you know, Frank Nitty doesn't fall off of a building. I'm sorry, that's a spoiler. Sorry. Anyway, uh, <laughs> these these are these are these are you know, a lot of these things. Uh, you know, I, I, th- I think a book just came out about the real Elliot Ness, uh, which is is you know quite different from uh, from from the uh, the stories that we've seen before. Uh, Elliot Ness still existed, uh, and we will continue to tell stories about him, and they'll continue to be influenced by the previous stories. And it, just like I, if I ever wrote anything for DC Comics, you bet the the the, the major influence on me would be those ten thousand books out there. Denny uh, O'Neill, yeah, Jim Aparo, all so these guys, a, Neil Adams. Yeah, I mean, it's it, this stuff does not get written in a vacuum, and uh, you know, I I think that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I understand particularly uh, that that there are other authors and other books that are going to be in a different situation because their stuff is set uh, in the time period, you know, right around when the movies will be. Uh, and yeah, I just don't know how they would have negotiated that otherwise. Uh, 
or, or, or dealt with that. You know, I, again, I, I am in a bit of a different situation because a lot of my work has been set in the distant past. But you know what? I, I never in a million years would have wanted the fact that I wrote Kenobi, a, a book that I love and a book that I, I, I know that a lot of people enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I never in a million years would want the existence of that book to prevent there from being a movie that would bring Obi-Wan Kenobi and his adventures in that time to another, you know, 20, 30 million people. It'd be, I hope that it, I hope that it would become a movie because I'd love to see yeah. the end battle with the crate dragon. Yeah. And, oh, it, it would be nice. It would, would it be nice if they used my, my story? If they yes. did a movie like that, that'd be great. And certainly I, I haven't, I haven't heard of them doing anything like that uh, or that they're, or that they're, or that that's even in the cards. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, look at, uh, Look at Guardians of the Galaxy and mm, all the yeah. stories that that drew on. Uh, you know, and and when you when you're writing these things, you really aren't thinking about 15, 20, 50 years down the road and what somebody might do with them. No, that that would be. No, I don't think anyone <laughs> like, can live up to, to that kind of pressure. You're trying to write a good book. That's right. that's really it. I mean, uh, so so anyway, yes, I uh, I I I I do sympathize with the uh, with with people who. Uh, are concerned. Uh, you know, I've I'm, I've given some of my reasons why I think things will be okay. Uh, I'm not going to be able to hand sell every single person out there, but <laughs> uh, I really do think that the ultimate proof is in the book itself, and that's why I'm glad that we've got these preview copies out there uh, because you know I I I think that uh, you know there's there's more light than heat when these you know the book is out there and available. Well said. You should be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it certainly is a big excitement for for us as fans to to read this new uh, fiction that's coming out from, especially from you. And and I know you've kind of taken taken a Twitter a little bit, uh, kind of uh, cutting down some of these uh, m- moments uh, as we anticipate the release uh, on September second. And was this something that came from you um, that you had done similar with with Kenobi, or is this Delaways a little? I did the I did the Twitter countdown with uh, with Kenobi and. I just knew that I had a enough little things that I wanted to say about it uh, beforehand. Uh, you know, people don't you know get to every interview that you give or every podcast that you record. Although they should all be listening to this podcast now. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they 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 can't possibly get to everything, and Twitter is just one more of many different uh, uh, media out there uh, to to reach people. Uh, but I, I found that it was it was kind of fun to do a little you know a snippet at a time. I had done a a, a, a countdown to the end of the Knights of the Old Republic series when it was uh, you know counting down to issue fifty on my blog, and that was one of the most popular features that I've ever run on the blog. But we seem to be past uh, the era where people go to blogs all, all the time. Uh, so I you know last year I tried to do it with Twitter and was very popular and uh, have been doing it again with uh, with New Dawn. And I'll probably do it for my Star Trek novel coming out uh, in January. Oh, I hope you do. I think so it would we'll be great if they'd, if they'd take all of your tweets and combine them into something to go into the paperback editions because they're, they're incredibly entertaining. Well, what happens is I know that uh, some of the other websites do you know, gather them up together at the end, or at least they did with Kenobi. They they put them all into one one big post. I think Roku Depot did that, and somebody else did that last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you know what? What a lot of that stuff is sort of the material or the first draft of the uh, thing that I always do after the book is over uh, and has been out for a while. I do a behind the scenes or production notes page on my website where I talk about the book and how it came to be and a little bit of trivia about, you know, what's in this chapter, what's in that chapter. Uh, and the Kenobi one that I wrote is like 20 pages long. <laughs> so it just because it took, cause that one took seven years to get out, uh, that, that, that book from the idea to the page. And so, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff that I remember for that. And I'll be doing one of those for, for new dawn as well. When I actually get it online, who knows? It depends on what I've got deadlining at the time, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's uh, something where people can go to farawaypress.com and read those uh and of course they can get uh my my twitter feed is jjm faraway and uh it's it's hard to believe but faraway press and uh, jjm faraway that 
that has nothing to do with Star Wars. Uh, that far away, <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's, it's something people have asked many times. It's actually a reference to an old Uncle Scrooge comic. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it, it, uh, it, it, it I, I've been using that. Uh, it, it was the name of Far Away Looks was the name of my column in Comics Buyer's Guide, 1999, back before I did anything for Star Wars. So, uh, so wow. yeah, it's. Yeah, so it, the fact that I'm doing Star Wars is uh, is just a coincidence. A very happy coincidence. So this is something I've been wondering for a while. How has life changed for you since the success of Kenobi? Well, it, it hasn't changed a whole lot in one sense in that, you know, I wrote two books uh, back-to-back in the, uh, the winter and spring of uh, 2013, and I just did two books back-to-back here. Uh, and then, of course, you immediately go into San Diego and – you know, the promotional period for, for the book. Uh, and it's very, it's, it's very exhausting and trying after having written that many words. And if there's a way that I can actually space out my novel so that I can get a month off in between, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, look, certainly uh, having had a, a book like Kenobi that rang all the bells that I intended it to, um, you know, there, there's not a word in that book that, that I would probably change just because, uh, it, uh, it, it, we, we had, we had quite a bit of time with it to get it right, to, you know, go through all the, uh, you know, all the, uh, you know, revisions that were necessary to get it to what I wanted it to be. Uh, and, you know, I, I just really feel that, uh, it accomplished what I intended for it to do. Uh, and you know, as for uh, the response from the fans, you know, it, it was just wonderful. I mean, I it was the first book that uh, first Star Wars book, and really the first book of mine that my mother has ever written, uh, sorry, ever read. Uh, you know, wow. And yeah, you know, my mother, my mother, uh, a, a grade school librarian uh, when she was working, uh, you know, encouraging me to to write uh, and uh, and uh, you know and read, uh, and also taking me to all sorts of movies, including Star Wars. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, in fact, it's it's to her that a new dawn is dedicated. Uh, you know, I I I really appreciated the fact that people uh you know, embraced that book in a place where my mom could see it. <laughs> so it, it doesn't it, get uh, much it, better than that. Yeah, I was gonna say that's a great story. Well, it it kind of it kind of uh, and she got to go to a she got to go to a signing uh earlier in that year uh and uh and sort of in a, in a library. And, uh, you know, got to sort of, you know, take the credit for having been, you know, there at the very beginning of this journey, uh, and, and all the way through it. So, yeah, I, I, I do really appreciate that, that people were, uh, receptive to that book and then kind when they talked about it. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm hoping we'll have, uh, some of the same dynamic with a new dawn. I think that's, uh, pretty much a guarantee. Absolutely. Uh, now, John, you t- talked a little bit, touched on a little bit, uh, your next project, and you're kind of switching franchises a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about that project? Well, it's not so much switching franchises as working in two at once. Uh, only guys, <laughs> only guys named JJ work in both Star Wars and Star. Wars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, no, that's, that's that's not true. Actually, quite a lot of people have done both. Uh, yeah, Christy Golden uh, uh, being an obvious uh, example. Uh, the uh, the opportunity came up in some downtime between Kenobi and uh, New Dawn. Uh, to write a uh, a novella for Star Trek, uh, and that came up. Uh, that came out in February. That was uh, that was Star Trek Titan. Uh, the name of the the name of the uh, series is Star Trek Titan, uh, and the the subheading is Absent Enemies. That's the name of the story. Uh, that was a novella that was uh, electronic only, uh, released in February, uh, dealing with uh, Admiral Riker. He's Admiral Riker now, and uh, and his starship, the Titan, and uh, it was. Uh, it was a fun little story, and uh, because I knew there might be some downtime here uh, in this year, I uh, you know came up with when they offered me the chance to write a full length novel. Uh, I came up with a, a concept that I had been thinking about for a good long while, uh, and the result is uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation Takedown is the name of the novel, and it, this thing is. You know, I have not had as much fun uh, just in terms of just pure uh, wow. Uh, I get to write this little thing in here in a while uh, because you know it was was it, the, 
you have you have your first time writing Star Wars, and this is my first story where I get to go to hyperspace. This is great. <laughs> uh, you know, you you kind of have that same feeling the first time you use a transporter beam, uh, or, wow, or, yeah. or 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 you know, get to have a, a ship decloak. Uh, you know, I, I I'm a fan of Star Wars. I'm a fan of Star Trek. I'm a fan of a lot of different franchises. There is that little there is that little uh, that little thrill of working with it for the first time that is that is different and so yeah i i had a lot of fun with it and uh you know it it, it is an adventure that pits captain picard uh, against his former uh his 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 former protege uh now admiral Riker. uh the two of them together in a uh in a uh oh. race across the stars where uh you know we never set foot on a planet uh, and that that is that that is you know, really connected to the kind of story I wanted to write a real naval style Star Trek story where mm-hmm. you know we are out there we are you know this is this is like Master and Commander we we don't go you know we're 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 at sea we're in space for this entire adventure uh, and so I I had a lot of fun with it and uh, you know, getting to play in that sandbox uh was uh was uh was one of those things where you know this is this is this is uh this is another another label stamped on your passport but uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh that book comes out january 27th and i'm uh, i'm looking forward to seeing that out there uh and no it does not mean that uh that i have uh, have gone to the dark side or <laughs> or or gone to the mirror universe even uh <laughs> to to use that phrase through the uh, looking but, glass uh, well, that's another one, yeah. Uh, but it it is uh, it, it it was a project that uh, I was uh, you know really enthusiastic to get to do. Well, I love that every time you describe these different universes and, and projects, you still have that same enthusiasm, and passion, and intelligence. You even ha- you even have some Conan stuff going on too. Yeah, I did a Conan. I did a short Conan story for uh, a uh, one of the issues of Robert E. Howard Savage Sword at the end of last year. Uh, that was the last comics work that I've done. That's that's actually uh, gotten out there. I've done some I've done some corporate comics work a little here and there in the meantime. Uh, but uh, you know things for you know guides for, for this video game or that video game. Uh, yeah, it's comics are something that it certainly are, is never far from uh, my heart. I'm still doing that. The, you know the Comicron website that I've always done mm-hmm. with the comics history uh and uh, i love that by the way oh thank you it, it again that's 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 been just a, a a project that i've done as a hobby for a long time but uh you know i find that i end up doing about as much media for that as i do for uh for star wars uh wow. and for my writing uh you know i i did marketplace on american public media the radio show earlier this the last month uh you know and, and i've had pieces turn up on uh you know, I, I was quoted today on uh, on one of the political websites, Vox, uh, cool. uh, where you know they were referring to you know the sales of comics uh, from the Guardians of the Galaxy line. Well, you know, obviously that's just one of the many things that I've got on my site, uh, and I've been uh, I've been working on a particular comics archaeology project for about twenty years now, and uh, this this year I kind of have really hit the accelerator to try to get that project done. Uh, and and wrapped up, and it has involved me buying you know, uh, probably about a thousand comic books that nobody would ever want. Wow! <laughs> so, uh, but uh, but this is all about building this database uh, of information about how comics have sold over the years, and why is it important? It's important simply to tell us where we came from and to give us a little bit of perspective. Every time the comics market booms, we're able to say, well, yeah, this is great and this is super, but here's how it was in the 50s. Uh, and, you know, that was a different time and a different era. And here's how things are different now. And, and every time the, the market hits a few bumpy months, uh, we need to be able to say, okay, here's what a real collapse of the comics market looks like. You know, let me introduce you to the late 1970s. Uh, before Star Wars saved Marvel comic, when we didn't think there would be comic books around in ten years, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is, I think, useful to have. And if I have a passion project uh, besides my own fiction and my own writing, and I'm going to be doing more of that as well, if I have a passion project. I think this has been it because it ties into you know what my day job was running the trade magazine for the comics industry in the '90s. Uh, it gives me a little continuity to my career, and uh, you know. Uh, it, it lets me feel that the work that we did 
um, on Comics Retailer Magazine and in Comics Buyer's Guide Magazine, two magazines that are no longer around. Uh, it, it, it allows me to feel that that's been preserved, that's still out there for people to find out about. And that's important. And if Corey and I ever do a spinoff comic book discussion, uh, we're going to have you be the first guest because you are certainly <laughs> – the man we're looking for for that. That's, that's great. That's very exciting to me because I'm a, I'm, I'm going to guess I probably have about 25 comic book boxes. I'm going to guess you have quite a few more than that. Uh, I had to get an engineer to come out and look at the floor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I see my I, wife I, won't think I'm so bad anymore. No, I have a building. Uh, I, that I, I bought the place that I've got because it has a second building, uh, just for the comics. Wow. So, I mean, it's not. It's, it's like, not ran, like it's like Rancho JJ over no, here. No, it's not. No, it's not that. It's not that. Uh, it's not that wonderful. Uh, you know, so it's it's an old <laughs> farmhouse, but uh, but yeah, I've got a I've got a garage with a loft over it, and I just I just had to, in fact, uh, pay to put a new roof over the thing. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, you know, once you get into uh, the tens of thousands for comic books, uh, you know, twenty five long boxes. Uh, that's uh, you know, that's about seventy five hundred books. Uh, but yeah, once you, once you get into the tens of thousands, uh, it's no longer fun. Uh, you're now, <laughs> you're, you're now looking at, you're, you're now into extreme makeover home edition territory, uh, <laughs> because it, you know, I, I, again, working with the comics magazines for all those years, we would get free comics and oh, you'd yeah. go, you know, Oh, wow. That's great. Free comics. And you know, if I, if I would complain about it, people would say, Oh, poor you, you get all these free comics. Well, every comic book costs about 25 cents to store. Um, with a bag and a mm-hmm. board, and particularly if you store your comics like I do, library style, spine outward, uh, in bookcases, uh, yeah, this is not wow. cheap. So <laughs> I would love to see a picture of that. Have you ever tweeted anything like that? Out? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a picture on my website, uh, farawaypress.com. Go to the about page. Okay, uh, you'll you'll see me in my uh in in the vault. Uh, you don't get a full on shot of the whole, you know, you know the aisles. But and the thing is, it's not even a big collection compared to a number of people I know where they've got, you know, they've got really serious collections where they you know, have rolling shelves and things like that, uh, you know, on the big tracks like you find at the college library. Uh, you know, it, comics are something that can take over a good, good part of your life if you let them. And, uh, yes. you know, I, yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I wonder where some of them came from. And I just, well, Corey, Corey sold, uh, most of his comic collection to get an engagement ring. Yeah. Oh, very good. That's, uh, you know, I, I sold, I sold comics for the first time in a long time last year. I, I sold just like 50 issues of walking dead because I thought, you know, this will not continue. Uh, not, not that walking dead will not continue, but the insane prices that walking dead comics are going for will not mm-hmm. continue. Right. And I tur- turned out to, a, I priced the market completely wrong. Uh, there's it, those, those prices keep going up and up and up crazily. And, oh my gosh. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, but more power to them. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, most of the stuff that I've got, I would, I, I, I would not part with because it's, you know, part of both my research and, and my childhood, uh, and, uh, you want to hang on to that. I understand. Well, we typically at this point of the interview, we, we ask our five questions. And since you're the very first person to ever answer our five questions, I only have one question for you. And that is how can people get in touch with you? Very good. Uh, yeah, my, my website is farawaypress.com. Uh, I am John Jackson Miller on, uh, just, you know, facebook.com slash John Jackson Miller. Uh, same thing for Goodreads. Uh, which I've been on for a while, uh, and then on uh, Twitter, as we mentioned, JJM Far Away. And I'm sure there's other ways to get in touch with me, but I've forgotten what they are. <laughs> well, all the ones that I know of uh, um, that you're comfortable with, I will certainly put on the show notes <laughs> so people can get in touch with you that way. And and I and I'm pretty sure, if my memory serves correctly. October 11th, you're going to be really, really close to where Corey and I live. I'm hoping that we can make that journey out to Barnes Noble to shake your hand and get an autograph. Yeah, that's uh, that's October 11th. I'll be at the Old Orchard Barnes & Noble for Star Wars Reads Day. That's in the Chicago area, uh, and uh, I'll be there for that. Uh, the Star Wars A New Dawn release event is actually in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin at the Barnes & Noble there. I'm really looking forward to that. That's uh, uh, the nearest big you know, bookstore near me, and I, I'm, I'm happy to support them. Uh, I, I have a, also a bit of a signing tour going through uh, Lexington, Kentucky, Knoxville, Tennessee, where I went to college. Uh, and, you know, South Carolina, my first signing in Charleston is going to be at Atomicon in November. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm getting to some places I haven't been to before. Did my first Denver convention earlier this year. Uh, and actually, if people haven't you know, been able to get someplace I've been and they're, they're looking to get a signed book, I do have a, a shop page on my website where I uh, do uh, you know, sell signed copies at, at cover price. <laughs> so that's, that's, cool. that's out there. That's out there as well. That's great. Well, yeah, hopefully Cor and I can make that tr- that trek and shake your hand. That would be awesome. Well, the, the, the only other thing I can think of uh, since we have you on is if you had to pick one comic book that was your favorite one, what would you pick? I'll tell you mine real quickly. Mine is Batman 251, The Joker's Five-Way Revenge, Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams. That To me, that that's it. I mean, there are a lot of them I love, but that one jumps one, up to me. One favorite comic book. Wow. I see that you... you Narrowing it down from fifty thousand plus. <laughs> yeah, it, I realize it's it's a uh, uh, arduous. You know, I'll 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 throw a uh, two or three here. I, I, I one of the earliest comics I remember loving was uh, uh, Uncle Scrooge comic book uh, Back to the Klondike. Uh, that's the one where he meets Glittering Goldie, uh, his 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 old flame from uh, from the uh, from the old days. That's actually that's the story where Far Away Looks comes from. Where the where uh, where I got Far Away from. Uh, the far away that's in my far away press. Uh, so, so obviously that one's back there. Uh, I really love the Sandman story where he, uh, the Neil Gaiman Sandman story where, uh, he meets Hob Gadling, who's that character who, uh, is, you know, has been granted eternal life. And so they, they meet each other again every hundred years at the same bar in England, which seems to have existed since the 1400s. Uh, and, and, you know, that is just textbook. Uh, in terms of how to write a great, you know, comic book story, you know, there's a lot of others like that. You're probably you're just way too many to name. Uh, I I you know, I really prize a comic book called Dreadstar by uh, yeah. Jim Starlin. Yeah, was, I know that one. Uh, Dreadstar uh, by Jim Starlin. Uh, Starlin, of course, responsible for a lot of the things that you saw in Guardians of the Galaxy, the movie. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, Dreadstar was this freebooting, uh, you know, space. Uh, not necessarily a pirate, but definitely he was a space mercenary uh, going around battling against an empire. Uh, you know, it, it it was not really Star Wars. It was it was it had a lot of other different influences, uh, and that came out from uh, Marvel's Epic line in the '80s. And it was actually Marvel's revival of Epic that first hired me uh, to do Crimson Dynamo. Uh, but but I I, I name checked Dreadstar many times when I was talking about Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, because a lot of the things that I did in in Coder, uh, he did in uh, you know, Dreadstar. He he hit a he hit a, a traitor in the cast for like two and a half years, and you know we did it for three. So <laughs> 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 I I was I was happy to be able to to do that, and uh, you know that's that's a good book that's out there. There's there's so many more. Well, Corey, we got to keep this fair. You're the co-host. Sure, what sure. You? <laughs> well, I, I, my first comic book was Wolverine number sixty-three. It was a, it was one I found at a supermarket comic book stand randomly, and it was my first fray into comic books. That'd always be my favorite, you know, just to always mm-hmm. last with oh, me. Yeah. But I've always enjoyed um, the Tim Sale uh, Batman Long Halloween. Yeah. So oh, that, that's that's excellent. So nothing wrong with that. Oh yeah, I mean there's 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 a yeah uh, there's a show and a half right there. So right. <laughs> yeah, there you yeah, go. I'm kidding. So that, there's your next podcast. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> well, well, John, thank you again so much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and, and to uh, to learn more about your writing process and uh, your analysis of your work and. It's just really, really great, and we always get so much feedback when we have you on and and love following you on Twitter, and we certainly look forward to chatting with you in the future and and seeing all the great things you have in store for all of us. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. We've had quite a few requests uh, for Coffee with Kenobi t-shirts, and right now we've got a special uh, offering going on at at Teespring. got Coffee with Kenobi t-shirts uh, featuring the brand new logo. They're orange, blazing orange. We call it Rebel Orange uh, for fans out there. And Teespring offers kind of like a, a Kickstarter campaign. You, you order so many shirts and they get printed. Uh, we've got three shirts uh, uh, in order to get everything printed and, and out there. Uh, right now we're sitting at 23 sold out of the 30. Uh, so get out there and order a shirt. Uh, support Coffee with Kenobi. All those efforts will be going towards uh, recording 
upgrades, future distributing fees, and even more uh, ways to tune into Coffee with Gnome. So check it out. We definitely have space for uh, folks who want to get on board and, and go past 32. So any, every little bit uh, helps. So check it out. Um, for those looking for a different style, we've got a, a, an orange, like I said, and we got a, a blue. Uh, we call it our force blue color and the, the ladies' tea style. Uh, so check them out, $28 a piece, uh, and help us out and support. Thanks a lot. I like the sound of that. Chewie, get us out of here! If you would like to respond to our question of the show, have a comment, or just want to say hello, send us an email or mp3 at feedback at coughwithkenobi.com. Or if you have a specific question or comment for either of us individually, email us at danz at coughwithkenobi.com or Corey C at coughwithkenobi.com or visit us at coughwithkenobi.com and click on the Contact Us section or comment on one of the stories featured on the site. If you enjoy the show, please write a review in iTunes. You can also like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash coughwithkenobi as well as keep up to date on our Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash coughwithkenobi. You can also find us on Tumblr at coughwithkenobi.tumblr.com. If you enjoy the jazz music, download the album Eye to Eye by Steve Torok on iTunes. Give the evacuation code signal. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.